Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. We have a fantastic returning guest and also someone who has been on our Down the Pub sesh. Alex, tell us who we got. Sorry, I just need to stop laughing. I'm just completely outwitting my cat, right? <laughs> Do you know what I did? Oh, I put my slipper socks on his favourite chair so that he lay on them for half an hour and then I just dragged them out from under him as he slept and they were warm and toasty and I put them on. I'm a genius and he's baffled it's like he realised he's been indentured without knowing it and he's like you swine anyway <laughs> I'm not even going to edit this out I'm so tired at this point Charlotte Ward is with us she's been with us before she's absolutely brilliant she used to work at Kensington Palace she's now at the Lloyd's Register Archive and she came and spoke to us about Chris, uh, Queen Victoria's Wicked Uncles which was fantastic but today we're going to do some justice aren't we because Charlotte you came on uh, to History's Greatest Death Scene and we laughed very hard at Carolina Farns Park, didn't we? We did, yes. So I, I, I thought it was probably about time that I actually told you about her life because it's a brilliant life um, rather than just her death. Yeah, so we did have a good old chuckle um, yeah. because yeah. we're mean and nasty. Um, <laughs> and we'll get to that in the end. But yeah. yeah, it is right that we talk about her properly because she's a character, isn't she? So what can you tell us uh, who don't have any idea, like Alina? because it's British royalty. Uh, who is she? Can you tell us who she is? What do we know about her and her early life? Yeah, so Carolina Barnsbach, she's, um, she's one of my favourite people from history. I think she's an incredible person, incredible woman and consort, and I don't think many people know that much about her. So she was the uh, wife of George II. Um and she's one of those consorts, I think, that people should put up there with, you know, uh, like Catherine of Aragon, Ellen of Aquitaine, uh, Queen Charlotte, George III's wife. Queen um, Mary. Queen Mary. <laughs> yeah, can't forget that, Queen Mary. That's a podcast Ooh. coming out you next month. <laughs> there you go, all the consorts. Um, but she had, uh, rather than just, you know, not just being a consort, she had this huge impact on society, culture, science, medicine, philosophy, and all sorts of uh, great things. Um, so she was born in 1683 um, to John Frederick, the Margrave, Margrave of brandenburg Arnsbach and Princess Eleanor. So Arnsbach was one of the smaller German states and um, unfortunately for Caroline, from a really, really young age, her life was fraught with trouble. So her father died from smallpox when she was three. Her mother remarried, but who she married was a really unpleasant man and and then he died and then unfortunately her mother died so sort of by 1696 um Caroline and her brother were orphans which is really really a sad start in life um but luckily for Caroline she ended up being sent um to live with her live with uh, Frederick and Sophia Charlotte who was the younger sister of George I, and she was allowed to grow up in their court, which was actually a, a quite a fortunate turn of events for um, poor old Caroline. So what was it like growing up in Sophia's court? Yeah, so, um, so Frederick and Sophia became king and queen of Prussia in 1701, and Sophia was really known for her intelligence and wit and a really strong character. So German princesses, compared to maybe British or other European princesses, were encouraged to pursue more intellectual subjects like philosophy and science, um, rather than maybe just focusing on languages or music or the kind of the the more accomplished uh, things princesses would do. So Sophia's court was known for being very liberal um, and attracting some of the great thinkers of the day, like Leibniz. Leibniz, sorry. Um, and then um, when Caroline went to this court, Sophia really encouraged Caroline to pursue education and learning, um, to take part in philosophical debates, to uh, learn more about science, um, to correspond with Leibniz, and um, she formed quite a, a, a sort of strong intellectual friendship with him. Um, and Sophia really doted on Caroline um, as a mother would to a daughter. So I think sort of a really um, interesting court in which Caroline was brought up in. Marriage in, the, in Europe in the 18th century, what could she expect and who did she end up 
shackled to. I feel <laughs> just like the totally uh, negative connotations as somebody who's not married yet. Who did she end up with? Who did she end up shackled? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, so obviously this, yeah, Europe in the 18th century, there were eligible princesses and, and princes and nobility across the continent. Um, so marriages were, of course, often used strategically, and this was to ensure, you know, alliances were made or for religious or economic reasons. So um, Caroline was reportedly um, both in- very intelligent um, and also very attractive, um, but she was not really personally very wealthy. Of course, her, her historic seat her family seat was was gone um and she was essentially the orphan living at another court um but she did have the backing of the king and queen of prussia so she did have some things on her side so she had a few suggestions sent her way uh, the archduke charles of austria was suggested but she didn't want to convert to catholicism um and then it's sort of thought ah oh, maybe um, the son of uh, George Augustus of Hanover could be suggested. So this would be uh, Sophia's nephew, uh, essentially. So this uh, George, um, his father had kind of become more important in European politics, shall we say, um, because in 1701, Queen Anne, Queen of Britain's, her only surviving child died uh, that means that meant that William III Queen Anne had no living heir and then they had to go through well over sort of 30 odd people to find the next heir which was Sophia the Electress of Hanover um, and then for her son George and then his son George so can we segue quickly just yeah. for people who don't know how we got to this point Queen Anne it's tragic isn't it it's incredibly tragic yeah so she had 18 uh, children and all of them died uh miscarriages stillbirths and then the only one to survive um survived to about the age of 11 and then he became ill on his birthday and died a few days later so she was you know she, her, it's that, not for want of trying to uh, no line was it <laughs> exactly i mean the Stuart line was already a bit contentious because of course he'd kicked james ii off the throne and his children were saying oh it's our throne where's it going and then you have william and mary who don't have any children themselves and anne who's obviously tried and failed um the poor 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 woman um and then it's a case of well we can't have catholics on the throne so where do we go with this and they have to go through the royal family and all the connections across europe to find an heir that has no Catholic connections. And that is where they land on this Sophia, who was the Electress of Hanover, and her son, George. Um, and he so wasn't he, very nice, was he? No, he, <laughs> <laughs> he was an unpleasant man. So Queen Anne, when she becomes queen, she hates Sophia and does not allow anyone from that family into Britain whilst, queen, whilst Anne's on the throne, which is a bit ridiculous when that's your heir. So there's already that divide. And then you've got George, um, Sophia's son, and he, um, yeah, so he was married um, to another woman called Sophia, just to make more things more confusing. It's a popular Uh, name at the time, isn't it? Yeah, if it's not Sophia, Charlotte. Charlotte, yeah. (laughs) I find it interesting that um, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have have really gone back to this period for the names for all their kids, well, apart from Louis, haven't they? They've gone yeah. Right, they've gone for proper Hanover names. Yeah, Louis a bit left field. <laughs> so yeah, so he, so George was married to someone else called Sophia. They had, uh, they had children. Um, who George, who becomes George II, Caroline's husband. Uh, but they don't like each other, and both of them have affairs. But of course, because Sophia having an affair is significantly worse than George having an affair. Um, her lover Konigsmark was um, killed. And then she was locked away for 30 something years. And that was the end of that. Oh, double standards. <laughs> As is always the case. <laughs> oh. <laughs> exactly. Um, so this means that you've got Sophia, the heir to Anne. You've got her son, George, which is Sophia's heir. And then you've got his son, George. 
So he is now going to be an heir to the throne. Um, and when the George II, George, uh, visited Hanover, um, he wanted to catch a glimpse of Caroline. He'd heard that she was a beauty um, and very intelligent. And um, his father, the one nice thing that George I did was to say to his son, George, please marry for love. Don't have a loveless marriage like I did because you'll end up locking your wife in a castle. So it's a bit out of character, isn't it? A little bit. But, you know, I think it's that, that you know, got to keep the Hanover line going. So um, George fell for Caroline. She was beautiful, intelligent, vibrant, and she had the perfect figure for the time. So she had uh, big boobs and was very curvy. And that's great. <laughs> that's great nowadays. Yeah, it's perfect. It's, the great, it's a great figure. Um, so what I always find surprising is that Caroline actually really liked George because George was not very intelligent, he wasn't very engaging, he's not the most attractive person if you look at his portraits, Um, but for some reason she saw something in him, um, and they married a few months later um, in August 1705. What was their marriage like though in the early years? I kind of, I'm imagining this incredibly smart woman, and this not so smart, not so handsome man. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> together it's, it's just not working for me in that in my head <laughs> for somehow it does work um but yeah we'll, we'll come to how how they how they make it work here yeah, um after a bit but um yeah so they they get to work straight away in producing an heir and prince frederick is born in 1707 um and then unfortunately a few months after this caroline caught smallpox and pneumonia so frederick was kept away from her for his own safety but george refused to leave her side um the the the, you know lovelorn but foolish man um because he inevitably caught the infection Uh, but fortunately they both survived this and were able to recover and caroline's experiences both from childhood and this would crop up uh with, with smallpox would crop up again later in life um so then she has three daughters um anne amelia and caroline Um, and they were all born in Hanover. So at the moment, everyone's still in Hanover. Then in 1714, Queen Anne dies. um, And a few months before this, Sophia, her Queen Anne's heir, had died. So Queen Anne must have loved that. (laughs) I win. (laughs) She probably did. She probably had a fist bump or something. Like, yes, go on. Um, I mean, she was also, at one point in her life, was, was thought that she would marry George, George I, um, but she didn't like him either. So I think... (laughs) either which way she wasn't best pleased um but yeah so george first becomes king and this of course means that george has to move from hanover to england he was not happy about this at all um he didn't even speak english did he really he didn't speak i mean this is a guy that's lived in hanover and then suddenly you know his 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 elderly mother is told oh by the way you're now the heir to the throne of, of britain and george is like oh hang on a minute i'm gonna have to leave germany he's uh his behaviour and his total like indifference is like partly why the role of prime minister has evolved as it has, wasn't it? Because it he just was. didn't bother turning up for councils and things. So someone had to be in charge and it kind of went from there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a, a like a, an incredible thing to, to have happened that, you know, we have this off, you know, what becomes a great office of, of state, the prime minister. And it's all just because, yeah, George didn't speak English and, couldn't be asked. Hanover, yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> he just went, oh, all right, uh, you do what you need to do and I'll, I'll, um, I'll leave. And then you did get, because it was uh, Robert Walpole, and you get a really kind of, um, as I'll go into a bit later, but you get a really um, interesting sort of relationship developing between George, King George, Caroline and, and George and, and Walpole. So it becomes, yeah, a, a bit interesting. Um yeah, so because, of course, he, he goes over to, to England, then um, George and Caroline also have to, to join him. Um, and, yeah, they, they, they sort of, well, George goes first and then Caroline um, follows him. And um, that's the last time, the first and only and last time that she ever travels by, by ship. Um, she just remains in, she's always just remained in two sort of different countries, bless her. What was her life like when she got to England? Yeah, so um, they, 
so the, the, the one thing about the Hanover family that I think continues throughout, as we saw with Queen Victoria and then beyond, is that the, the father and the son tend to not get on. So George first becomes king and the Prince of Wales and Caroline is made Princess of Wales and the first is Catherine of Aragon. So what they decide to do is kind of one up George the first. So George is going, I don't care about this country. I don't speak English. I'm going back to Hanover. Whereas George and Caroline um, made sure that their court, um, which they moved to Leicester House in London, um, was all about being English. So they learned the language, they celebrated the culture and politics of England, they liked the quirks of the British people, um, and they, you know, those that didn't like the king would go to George and Caroline's court instead. So there was these two kind of rival courts forming, which was not going too well with George I. He was a bit miffed about this. Um, and then Caroline and George, you know, they they also had their own um, issues developing through this so as I said before um, with Walpole um, he decided he would align himself with Caroline and George initially to kind of work his way in there discuss politics actually get some response rather than what he'd get from George I which was nothing Um, and then it was kind of thought oh maybe Walpole and Caroline who became very close could help reconcile um, George and George and um, they they thought that somehow they'd work it. This didn't happen, but Walpole and the Whig party gained favour once again with George I, and this really annoyed Caroline and George, so they got rid of Walpole from their kind of circle, um, and instead they turned their court into a place for literary figures like Jonathan Swift, for science, uh, for art, for, for um, philosophy, and all sorts of other things. So it's quite a vibrant place the big thinkers of the day just descended on George and Caroline um, making their court quite fun I think. You've already mentioned uh, a few of their children but how many children did they end up having in the end? Yeah so in the end they ended up having eight children Um, so most were born in Hanover and then they had a few when they moved over to England. Unfortunately um, they one of the first pregnancies Caroline had or the first pregnancy Caroline had after moving to England was a stillbirth and her friends back in Hanover said well this was due to the incompetence of British doctors this wouldn't have happened in in Hanover or Germany um and then there because of the 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 number of children they were having and and the the heirs that they had this also led to the, the tensions growing between George and George um that they were used as sort of political pawns so King George would take some of the children away from Caroline and and George um, and keep them to himself. He kept the daughters, you know, he wanted to come close to Frederick um, and he kept them away. Um, And one of the tragic stories was that she had a young son, George William, who was born in 1717. Um, They took the baby from her and then unfortunately the, um, the baby died and became very sick and, and died at Kensington Palace. So you can see that that you could, this horrible kind of family relationship was developing, and you know the kids were being used against their own parents, and you know whose side were they on? It was a, it was a very um, unpleasant situation, I think. It's definitely completely different to now, isn't it? I think. Do you? They seem to in this period they've gone to suddenly having a massive amount of children. Like yeah. many more than, but is that just because medicines got better? I mean, perhaps and records are better kept. Like perhaps there were as many pregnancies for, us, say, like Catherine of Aragon, but mm. they didn't progress far enough for a stillbirth, or it just yeah. it's, they suddenly seem to explode with the amount of breeding. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there's, they haven't got Netflix or anything, so yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think I think part of it is that is that is the I think the Hanover line coming over. Um, they seem to breed because you know they like rabbits. George the Third and and his motley crew. Yeah, sorry that they just don't stop. Um, but yeah, I think I think part of it is possibly that it is just you know. I mean, the, the last couple with Queen Anne must have just walked out. <laughs> 
I would have, yeah, I mean, I would have thought so. Um, I don't know how these women did it, to be honest. No, especially like without anaesthetic and Mm. drugs and (laughs) (laughs) cesareans and yeah. yeah. All the good stuff. And to go through all, not only all the, almost continuous, continuously being pregnant. Yes. Kind of your life. Um, and then obviously having to deal with the tragedies of a miscarriage or stillbirth if that happened and then to have the children and then to have you know to essentially <laughs> keeping them alive <laughs> yes yeah, so it's to the age of five isn't it and then you, yeah. you can kind of relax a bit yes okay okay they, they, they've reached that age um and then and then, well in caroline's case have her eldest turn around and be a bit of a uh a, a, well not yeah (laughs) (laughs) let's just be honest yeah (laughs) she (laughs) becomes queen alongside her husband in 1727 doesn't she what role does she play in court and how does she influence her husband yes so um yeah so when they become from uh, king and queen and crowned at westminster abbey um and firstly so caroline because of her intelligence and um very social and charismatic so she's able to you know i think it's this this point where people realize if you talk to caroline you're going to get what you want so one of the first things she did was in persuade her husband george to keep walpole as prime minister because he still had the majority in the house although george hated walpole caroline saw that you know, if, if he was to get rid of him, it would just rock the boat completely. So that was quite a sort of politically astute there. She's, she knows, she knows how to play the game. Um, and then she would essentially balance the two. So Walpole and George having problems, they would both go to Caroline and she'd kind of work to balance the two. Um, so she also had a very liberal principles, uh, which she got from Sophia. Um, so she supported things like freedom of speech in parliament, freedom of the press, um, and she also supported clemency for the Jacobites, who were the, the those that supported the rest of the Stuart uh, line that had been yeah, removed from the succession um, after James II. So quite liberal. Um, and then, of course, you have uh, her court at Kensington Palace, um, and it was a very grand affair. The King's State Apartments had been redecorated by William Kent under uh, the instruction of George I. But the courtiers would, um, att- you know, these very elaborately dressed, beautiful mantua dresses that you had to walk sideways through a door. And it was dancing, drinking, gambling. But they really wanted to go there and talk to Caroline about science, philosophy, politics and, and everything, just, just to get a chance to talk to her. The problem was court could last for hours um, of standing. You weren't allowed to sit hours and hours standing in the king's apartments um and one of my favorite stories that i used to tell was you know if a courtier was there um there weren't things as such things as toilets um so the men would simply go in the fireplaces they'd be sort of hay dotted about but the women had young servant boys usually who would hold these things that looked like gravy boats and oh, it- no <laughs> Yeah. And if they needed the gravy boat, they would sort of wink, acknowledge their little servant. He would run along, lift the flap up at the back of the mantua dress, stick it under. They would go and then they'd remove it and run off. Um, so it's very grand and beautiful and, and vibrant, but also incredibly smelly. Yeah. <laughs> Just a bit awful, icky. A bit foul. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, she's, you know, she's, she really likes to encourage that sort of conversation and and one of my favorite things or stories about her that I don't think people necessarily know and it's very relevant for right now considering the vaccine that is coming out um but smallpox was one obviously a disease that was just horrific in the 18th century and uh, and as I said it popped up in her life uh, quite a bit um but her friend Lady Mary Wortley Montague who was a frequent a visitor at her court she was a well-known writer and traveled around the world and particularly the ottoman empire um and she'd seen how they were starting to uh, use immunization against smallpox so lady mary brings it back to england since about 1721 um caroline offers up six prisoners um and says you, you're either going to be executed or you can have this immunization they say immunization thank you very much um 
they survived and then because she saw it was it had medical value she offered up three of her children to be inoculated and this was an incredibly monumental thing to do so having you know the royal family use something that had never been seen before in britain was incredible and that was caroline like leading the way um which is another reason why i just i think she's just great Brutally speaking, though, it's not like she, if there's something went wrong, she's got other kids, right? There's loads of them. <laughs> well, that is true. I mean, she only went for like three of them out of the eight. Yeah. So, you know, she's she hedging her bets a bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've got, I've got backup, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Still, that is, it is remarkable. Yeah. I do like her. I like her a lot. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. I think she's brilliant. Even you though she pees out the back of a flap in her dress. <laughs> <laughs> yes but everyone did it's fine you and i would have had to have done so i would have held it i'm not doing that <laughs> <laughs> just like <laughs> it would be like you know or um i don't know if you see that episode of Grey's anatomy where they're arguing over who gets to do a surgery and who can stand the longest because it's like 14 hours long and oh they my god wearing yes. those adult nappies <laughs> 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 They're all walking around the uh, hospital in them. Oh, I love that. No, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Uh, well, I hope I haven't ruined any uh, uh, dinners <laughs> when you when you next pick up a gravy boat. Why, those dresses, though, they literally look like they've got a mattress wedged up their skirt. Mm. And I just, I don't get it as a an aesthetic. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great... So the reason that they ended up being like that, so they, they just started going out to the side rather than backwards, um, was because the, the, it would be a way for the husband to show how wealthy he was, because it would show how much um, material he could afford. So essentially, you became like, you know, a, a fancy sports car or something. You were just mm-hmm. there going, look, my husband can afford this much. I can't walk through a door. <laughs> Mine would be a napkin because that's as much as I can afford right now. Yeah, exactly. Lena would basically be covering her bits with a paper yeah. napkin, like uh, <laughs> like Eve. Yeah. yeah, with a bev nap. Probably more comfortable than a mantua dress. That's you know. this is true, but yeah, lot lot less subtle when you need to go to the toilet and you call the boy yeah. over. Yeah. <laughs> you've um, you've mentioned uh, her son Frederick earlier. Mm. tell us what their relationship was like because it wasn't very good was it no it was not and it continues this wonderful Hanover tradition and where parents do not like their eldest son um so he's when they came over to England when George first became king Frederick stayed in Hanover because they wanted him to have that sort of education back in Hanover and he eventually comes over to England in 1728 he's now fully grown um but he's a womanizer and he has many debts because you know what you're going to do you're you're a young prince running around Hanover um so initially that you know that the the relationship becomes quite tense because George II makes Caroline his regent rather than his heir which was not the normal thing to do um and then the tensions continue to grow so Frederick again tries to do the one-up thing about how English he is so he takes it a step further and starts playing cricket and things like baseball, which were, were very English sports at the time. Um, so he's like, yeah, I'm more English than you guys. And look at me, I'm great. Um, so then we have uh, him marrying Princess Augusta in 1736. It was an arranged marriage. Um, and then swiftly after this wedding, George goes over to Hanover and Caroline is left in charge. And... Um, it was, you know, well, great, there's a wedding, I'm off. Um, so then George needs to come back, and on his way back, he is, uh, his ship is hit by a terrible storm. No one knows what's happened to him. Caroline thinks he's lost, and all the while, that all this, sort of, this tragedy is going on, Frederick is sitting down, having a lovely dinner um, with all of his friends, celebrating, which you can really imagine annoyed his, his mum, Caroline. Um, then I suppose the final nail in the coffin of their relationship um, happened in the summer of 1737. So in June 1737, Frederick says to his parents, my wife is pregnant, uh, but she was due in October. And it was tradition at the time 
that a member of the royal family or senior courtiers had to be present at the birth of any royal baby. And this is to make sure that there were no fake babies or one of, another one of those warming pan stories. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So uh, he sort of said, right, she's due in October. Augusta wasn't actually due in October. She was due in July. So she went into labour uh, whilst they were at Hampton Court Palace. And this was in the night. And his, his uh, well, Caroline, his mother, was there in the palace. So he decides, whilst his wife is in labour, and I cannot keep stressing that enough, she was in labour, he bundles her into a carriage and rides across the night um, to St. James's Palace. So that's quite a journey in a rickety carriage, small, she's in labour, um, they get to St. James's Palace, Caroline awakes, she's horrified to find out that her son has done this, and takes her two daughters and Lord Harvey, her close companion at court, uh, over to St. James's. And then when they arrived, Augusta had already given birth to a baby. Um, this was a child also called Augusta. And she was the elder sister of George III. And Caroline was relieved to find that the baby uh, was a poor, ugly little she-mouse. And not <laughs> a large, fat, healthy boy. So this meant that because the baby was a little she-mouse, that it had to be Frederick and Augustus and not an imposter. Very insulting. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you didn't have DNA, did they? <laughs> that nonsense in replacement. Yeah, not, not quite. Oh, that looks like my son. Yeah, great. That's theirs. Um, yeah, so the, the relationship just never recovered from, from really that moment. <coughs> She's, she's regent at some point, isn't she? How does she fare and how does this come to pass? Yeah, so um, as I said before, when George II became king, he, of course, he's, traditionally they would appoint a regent in case anything happens. And usually it goes to the heir, which makes sense. Um, but he, not liking his son, made Caroline his regent, which has happened before Henry VIII made Catherine of Aragon um, his regent. Um, and this was just when George, again, he, as much as he tried to be English, he really did love Hanover. So he would try and go back as much as he possibly could. Um, and Caroline was relatively successful as a regent. Um, she helped negotiate peace with Spain and she diffused what could have been um, a, a rather turbulent situation with Portugal. As I said, she was very liberal, so she kept trying to push through kind of liberal ideas and acts into Parliament. She wasn't able to do too much, um, you know, because that's a bit too liberal for Britain. It was possibly going too far. Um, but, you know, she, she was relatively successful and, and she was very popular, um, which I think, again, great. Good for her. <laughs> Right, so we've discussed this on our uh, on History Hack, didn't we, uh, about her death? <laughs> Sorry, we did have was... a chuckle. It is utterly unique, isn't it? <laughs> it is quite a death. Um, and I, yeah, I've got to tell it again. Um, so Caroline, on the birth of her last child, um, developed a hernia. And she kept this secret from everyone for several years. And she didn't want to worry George, who was a worrier. Um, and she, so she always wore a shift dress. Um, she was never completely naked. She, you know, just, just kept it hidden. And then after sort of about 10 or so years, it becomes so painful that she collapses in agony at St. James's Palace in 1737. And they sort of reveal that she has this hernia now today we know the hernia you can just sort of push it back in and it's all fine they didn't really know what a hernia was uh, uh, back then um, and then you have these two doctors coming in two schools of thought of how to deal with it but essentially the idea was oh it's a lump we need to remove it so they go in and try to remove it and they're just hacking away at her guts and, and trying to you know, realise that the lump isn't, <laughs> it's going, but it's not. Um, and at one point in this horrific surgery, you know, no pain relief. Yeah, she wasn't unconscious. She was there. At one point, 
the doctor leans over with his powdered wig and his candle. The powdered wig is set alight. Um, and Caroline says, you know, please stop operating on me. I have to laugh. This is hilarious. You know, so this woman who is in agonizing pain is just laughing at a doctor running around with his wig on fire, who's also having to deal with the fact that George is, you know, saying, save my wife, save my wife. What is going on? So there's this whole scene that goes on. Um, and then they, they continue operating. And then it gets to the point where George is saying, well, is she okay? Is, is, is everything okay now? And they go, yeah, yeah, we, we, we think we've got rid of it. Um, and so they give her an enema. And then the, the, the enema results in almost the sort of bowels then exploding and covering pretty much everything you see around. Um, and she, ha- she survives for a few days after that. Um, unfortunately, then she, she dies. Um, and then during the sort of two or three days that she lives with an exploded bowel, um, Frederick asks to see her and uh, George says no. But Caroline does send a message to Walpole to say, you know, sorry, I forgive you and all of that. So she, you could tell that as a mother, even then, she's, she still wanted to know him to know that, you know, she loved him as, as a mother. George never left the side. Um, and she said to him, look, once I die, I want you to be happier, you know, go and remarry. And George says, no, I'm only going to have mistresses. That's all I want. I mean, he'd already had Henrietta Howard throughout most of their marriage. He'd got another one lined up. So it's like clarifying for your dying wife that you will get laid, but you're not going to read. Exactly. I mean, I mean, that's obviously the thing she's most worried about. Um, and then unfortunately, yeah, Caroline dies. Um, oh, what a way to go, though. So, I mean, in reality, then you would just be waiting for the bacteria to take hold wouldn't you and the fact that you've got yeah. no efficient drainage system to just yeah. finish you off oh what yeah. a way to go it's that i mean again you know it's what such a remarkable life that she led and, and everything that she achieved and, and did and yeah that is how she died I should clarify that the laughing was because they managed to like set fire to things, didn't they? When yeah, they were trying yeah, to treat they, her and yeah. she was trying to poke her own intestine back in, and it there was a comical <laughs> element to it. We're not exactly just no, sadist. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 yeah, I'm not laughing at her dying. No, no, no and alcohol was involved. She was laughing. Yeah, ex- well, yeah, exactly. We were down the pub, yeah. um, but no, it was she was laughing, and I think because she had this great sense of humour and and it was. was just did, did enjoy having a lot i just like the fact that despite the fact that her god goodness knows what was going on with her bounds dots are running around with this powdered wig alight and she has to laugh and i just find that just hilarious so she was allowed to laugh and she was laughing and we are too I, I absolutely don't and and she would be dead by now even if it didn't happen anyway yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Charlotte, thank you so much for coming back on to do some more Georgian history with us because we never do enough. Um, and mm. I, there are some great stories in there, and I'm glad I feel better now we've rounded her out instead of just mm. drunkenly laughing at her. Yeah, uh, I, I I feel like she she'll she'll be resting happy now with with George. <laughs> yeah. Join us a bit later because the time has come. We've been doing Sharp specials on all the separate episodes and we have reached Sharp's gold. This is the one that Sean Bean listed as his least favourite Sharp. He thought it was nonsense. The cast as well have said that they thought it was bonkers. There's a reason that it ended up the way it did uh, and it doesn't mean they didn't have a blast filming it. So join us because we will have a load of cast with us and we will talk all about making this episode. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.